All right. So we recently implemented um, include once functionality in port. Does anyone remember? So essentially in port, you can include uh, other files, right? As part of the compilation, for example, in here, uh, the main compiler includes the standard library. And uh, we recently implemented, so you can't include the same file twice. It will be effectively ignored. Right, so, and the way we did in mind that uh, the file was not included the second time is by literally that specific name, right? So, which is not particularly reliable, right? But the code that identifies that, um, you know, that needs to be included once is already there, right? Um, so, we can even uh, take a look at that. So, it's going to be foo.port and uh, let's write a simple hello world, I suppose. Um, so, std.port, right? So, that's the valid thing. Uh, and now I can do something like this. Hello world. And this is puts, right? And I'm going to just try to run foo.porth. There we go. As you can see, it prints hello world, right? If I try to include std.porth twice, it will uh, say that, okay, uh, it was already included. So if I try to actually give it a different name, I think it will not compile, but it may actually compile. Oh uh, yeah, so it didn't compile, as you can see. So because, yeah, essentially it tried to compile this one and then it tried to compile this one. And since this is not the same as uh, this one, right, it tried to include it. So an include once didn't work out. So we need a more reliable way to, um, to sort of, um, you know, identify whether the file was unique or not. So one way to do that is to use the absolute path to the file, right? So, and of course, um, um, you would say that with a sim link, you can sort of trick the compiler uh, into like including the same file twice. But to that, I will say, if you're starting to use uh, sim links to treat the, trick the compiler, why would I stay in your way? Right, if your goal is to trick the compiler, if that's what you need for whatever reason, maybe maybe the compiler doesn't really do what you wanna do, and you do wanna include the same file twice, why would I stay on your way uh, and prevent you from doing that, right? Obviously, you, you're you trying to do some like magic trickery, like you're putting a lot of effort into trick the compiler. Let's just let you trick the compiler, right? What we wanna try to do, we wanna prevent accidental inclusion of uh, of the same file. If you're intentionally trying to do that, all power to you. We're trying to prevent the accidental one. And that's why I'm using the absolute paths and I don't care about symlinks. I'm just saying that for the people who will just pop in and say, what about symlinks? Well, if you're using symlinks, that's probably what you want, right? Why would, would we stay on your way? Uh, you see what I mean, right? You see what I mean? Uh, so anyway, um, and Interesting enough, recently I implemented uh, the absolute path function for port, uh, which actually does that. So essentially you can just take this path and you can do something like abs path and uh, we'll try to print that, right? And it will convert this entire thing into absolute path. So let's take a look at how it works. Uh, so I'm gonna just print that. And as you can see, this is absolute path. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? I think it's pretty cool. So yeah, and uh, it actually does a lot of cool things. For instance, it will even convert this thing into a proper absolute path, right? As you can see, right? So it went one folder up, it went one folder up and it's not inside of port anymore. So, and yeah, so you can already grab this thing and use it, but you will have to be careful because to implement something like that, obviously you have to allocate the memory. And uh, as with any sort of like intermediate uh, memory allocations in port, it is done within the temporary buffer. So keep in mind that ABS path allocates a lot of memory in the temporary buffer. So what you wanna do, you wanna remember the current state of the temporary buffer, right? Then you wanna basically do absolute path and then you want to rewind the state of the temporary buffer so basically free all of the memory that was allocated by abs path right so and the temporary buffer is basically a linear buffer where you append things 
So you just keep appending things in there. Uh, and this is basically deallocating everything that was allocated since this call. Right, so we remember the state of the temporary buffer, we do whatever we want, we leak as much memory as we want, and we basically like deallocating all of that memory in one sweep. Right. So that's basically what we're doing in here. Uh, this is the absolute path. So the way absolute path works is actually rel relatively simple. Um, <clears throat> so we... Um, Call, uh, call to get CWD. So get CWD is a Linux syscall, right? And it gets the current working directory. So we get the current working directory. Then we join it with whatever you provided. Current working directory slash uh, whatever we provided. And we got the path. And after that, we normalize that path, right? So I have a separate function called norm path, which essentially uh, removes any dots in the components of the path, it removes any dot dots, it basically follow dot dots back, and also it removes the extra slashes. So it basically normalizes the path, and I stole the entire FD of path normalization from Python uh, standard library. So I literally stole it from Python st uh, standard library. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's how it works. And in fact, ABS path in Python also implemented the same way, right? It gets CWD, join it with the path and normalize it. So that's how it's done. Uh, yep. And normalization of the path is actually a relatively complicated topic, uh, right? So because, for instance, in POSIX, you are allowed to start with double slash, but if you have more than one slash, it should be treated as a single slash. So it's kind of like a special case in here. So it is really, really strange. And depending on whether you start with the slash, uh, dot dot might be interpreted differently because if you try to go up one level from the root, you should stay at the root. But if you're not at the root, like you have to do different things. So there's a little bit complicated logic, but I actually, uh, I think I implemented everything. So there might be some bugs here and there, but uh, I have a couple of like test cases for path normalization. So, so we can normalize these kind of paths. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so and um, so essentially we already have absolute path thingy. And I think the only thing we need to do now is we need to hook it up into the compiler. We need to make the compiler use this absolute path stuff uh, as an indicator that you don't want to include, uh, that you already included that module, right? So that's basically what we need to do. Uh, let's go ahead and try to do that. Um, so I'm gonna maybe remove this thing. Maybe I should have not removed that, but anyway. Uh, include once abs path, right? Abs path. So let's go into the port port. Port port port. So recently I implemented a function include path resolve, uh, right? And include path resolve accept whatever you have after include, right? So if you do something like uh, include std.port, that thing gets passed into here, right? And what this function does, it iterates through all of the include paths in the list. We have a list of the include paths. We append that thing into the include path and we check, does that file exist? Okay, if it doesn't exist, we try another include path and we check, does that file exist? And if it exists, we return that path back, right? And then that path get inc gets included and, you know, processed and compiled and stuff like that. So, yeah, and I think this is where we can try to do that, All right? So, this is where we return the entire thing, so we get the path, we convert it into uh, this string. And I suppose this is precisely where we can try to do abs path. I think this is where we can do that, right? So, in that way, uh, include path resolve file will return uh, not only the path that you have to include, but it will also return it as an absolute path, right? So, yeah. So, making it absolute normalized path is uh, part of the resolving, right? So, this is going to be part of the resolving. And that should be enough, theoretically, but something 
may break. So let's just go ahead, uh, go ahead and try to compile this entire thing and see if it will break anything. So porth dot porth. Okay. So so far so good. It is compiling. So I should have not run it. But anyway, let's try to recompile the compiler yet again. Oh, okay. So here we go. So it in the logging, it's going to be printing the the absolute path now, uh, which is fine, I guess. I'm not sure if we even need this kind of logging, uh, but yeah, we'll see, we'll see. Mm -mm. Okay. Uh, so let's see uh, if that example will work out. So I should have not removed that file. Mm, hello world. Uh, puts new line. And uh, let me just do foo, right? And everything seems to be working, right? And now if I try to include std like that, it is still working. That's actually pretty cool. Right, so, okay. Uh, if I do something like this, this should also work. Yeah, we're, we're catching all of these cases, actually. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Really cool. is, is it that simple? Uh, right. And again, of course, you can do some simlinks and stuff like that. But again, if you want to do simlinks, we should probably allow you to do that. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, so maybe I'm, I can try to, um, to do something more sophisticated. Do I want to do something more sophisticated? Uh, some sort of like a diamond inclusion, which is spread across several folders, if that makes any sense. Right, so we can try to do something like that. So here is the foo file, uh, and in here we're just gonna have uh, something like foo. Right, so here is the foo. Uh, then let's have bar, uh, which also includes uh, std.port, but it might include it from some other folder. I don't know, we can move it into examples, right? So we can move it into examples. So this is gonna be proc bar in. Uh huh. So this is going to be bar puts uh, cool. So and let's create main, which is going to include both uh, foo and uh, include bar dot port. And here in in the main, we're going to do foo uh, and then bar cool. Uh, so. Now, if I try to do something like this, if I try to compile main, uh, it kind of worked and I'm surprised that it worked. Huh. Especially for the bar. Right, how did it do that? Because... Huh. Oh yeah, I know how it did that. So because one of the things, one of the places where search where we search for the std is dot std. So what it did, it tried this path and it found it, right? <laughs> so it, it literally found it. So everything's, everything is okay in here. Um, I wonder, like, I don't know, uh, where can we do all of that? Um, where can we do all of that? So I can move bar into example somewhere, right? So this is gonna be like that. I'm moving that into the examples. Uh, and if I try to compile the entire thing, it will say that bar not found. But in here, I also have an ability to include some paths. So I will say add examples into the include paths. And that worked out. Okay. So, yeah. And it didn't include anything twice or anything like that. That's pretty cool. Uh, I may also want to uh, do something like bar. Uh, and let's say include uh, foo.forth. I wonder if it's gonna... yeah, okay. Um, might as well try to do it like that, right? Because I'm including it from different angles. It's actually pretty cool. So that kind of works. Hmm. So it catches all of the cases. So I didn't expect that it was, was going to be so easy. Uh, the only problem we might encounter is when we include ourselves, I think. Because as you can see, it prints the target program it prints the target program as just this, which might not be ideal, I think. I don't know. All right, which might not be ideal. 
So maybe we also want to normalize the um, the program that we're compiling. Mm. So we can include the port compiled from a, uh, anywhere using .port. Yeah, you can. But it's not really going to work. Uh, because the if you're trying to make a program with its own entry point, uh, you're going to have a problem because the compiler itself provides its own entry point. And there's no really a way to override the entry point of the compiler. Right. But maybe in the future we're going to uh, separate some of the parts of the compiler so you can include them. In fact, uh, for a long time, I wanted to take everything related to lexing of the compiler and move it to a separate file. So then you can use the Lexa from other places from to create some other tools, um, right? That will be kind of you know, kind of useful. Or maybe uh, like separate everything related to type checking, so we can have a type checking separate from the compiler, uh, right? And also use it for something. So I want to like split the compiler into sort of like these parts that you may want to reuse for different tools. Right. So, but since I didn't have like a more or less robust way of like organizing the modules and the files, I didn't do that. So now we're moving towards like having more or less usable module system. It's not particularly module system right now, but we're moving there. Uh, so I may start to separate things. Uh, mm -mm. So what parser generator do you use for Porth? This one these two things generated the parser. Uh, in fact, uh, like you don't even need to have them. It's just like you need to some way to input text into the computer, right? So there's nothing intrinsically superior in these two things. It's just like one way to input data into the computer. So if we have any other way of inputting data into the computer, that will work too, right? So hands are, even hands are not really necessary. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, I found some unexpected behavior is uh, absolute paths meant to deal with uh, already absolute paths. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a good question. Wait a second. I want to uh, actually copy paste it for anyone uh, who's watching right now. So. Let me, let me see. Thank you so much, MM2PL. Uh, so I found unexpected behavior. Is absolute path not meant to deal with already absolute paths? Hmm. Okay. So if you have already absolute path, uh, returns the same as... Okay, let's actually find out. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So foo.port, maybe I'm going to go into here. Uh, right, and I'm gonna just do a ABS path, and maybe I'm gonna comment it out. So maybe you found a bug, probably. That's probably what happened. Uh, okay, so, and let's do puts. Okay, that's very interesting. I wonder how Python deals with this kind of stuff. Uh, right, so if I do Python 3 uh, from OS, because I kind of like, I kind of stole the whole thing from Python, believe it or not. <laughs> Uh, so abs path, uh, ah shit, path, abs path, uh, okay, so it detects that it's absolute path, so uh, path, uh, file, okay, so then uh, abs path, okay, how did you do that, oh, okay, <laughs> all right, so they first check if the path is absolute path, and if it is not absolute path, they do the thing I do, but otherwise they normalize it. Okay, so I think I skipped that part. So is there anything special about is ABS path? Uh, let me find out. Uh, start, okay, so they, ch they just check whether it starts with the separator. There's nothing particularly special. Um, okay, so you found a bug. It would be nice to have some tests for absolute paths, but here is the problem. Absolute paths differ depending on the environment where you're testing. So if we're going to be testing on some CI in the future, those tests are going to be breaking, right? And depending on your computer, the output paths are going to be different. So I don't think we can easily test all of that. Uh, so because of that, I'm not going to test that. Syscall emulation. We need Syscall. Yeah. <laughs> maybe Syscall emulation. Or maybe we could use something like chroot 
right? So sage root environment. Also, not a bad idea, but setting that up is actually too much effort in my opinion, right? So I'll have to modify the test.py script to set up ch root environment as far as i know ch root is also like a syscall stuff right so is there yeah there is even a function so we don't even have to use uh that that thing so it's part of the posix uh wait a second can i just ch root myself into can i wait a freaking second Okay, so uh, is chroot a syscall? Uh, uh, Linux syscall. That's a very interesting question. Uh, uh, okay, I, I know. Okay, so that should be fine. Uh, syscall Linux. So I just wanted Chromium. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Everything's fine, chat. Everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Okay, so it is syscall. We can just freaking use that. Okay. Uh, all right. Proc. So it does return, I suppose it returns the pointer, right? So I'm going to assume that it returns the pointer. Uh, inline, inline proc, ch root. And what we accept, we just accept, I guess, the pointer, right? And it returns something. Let's say that it returns the pointer. Sys, uh, uh, ch root. Uh, syscall one. There we go. So what I want to do is basically um, set ch root to tests, right? Uh, set ch root to tests, and maybe I want to check if this entire thing is not less than zero. Uh, in that case, I want to do something like error uh, could not ch root uh, input one exit. And what can I do now? What can I do now? Uh, so if I go into the tests, that means uh, I should be able to see something like two swap dot port. Okay. Uh, oh, this one has to be C, by the way. Right. Uh, two swap port slash, and I can check whether this file exists or not. Right. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And I think it has to be also C, right? Slash swap worth exists, exists, put, uh, does not exist. All right. So we can try to do something like that. Uh -huh. mm -mm -mm -mm. So unknown sys. Huh, unknown type. Oh. Okay. Uh, and in here, so I probably it has to be. Okay, let's let's just return an integer. Doesn't really matter. Could not ch root. Hmm. It could not ch root. So I probably then don't know how ch root works, right? So let's take a look at uh, at the ch root uh, thing. Yeah? Uh, changes the root directory of the colon process so they specified this so it could be something about permissions right so we may not have the permissions mm, search permission uh, is denied on the component path prefix so yeah let me let me see what exactly happened mm -hmm. oh my god dupe right zero Mm -hmm. Less, and here we're gonna also drop this entire thing. Uh -huh. So, and then I wanna dupe input e u, and then we can do uh, e put. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's one. So what is one? Mm, does anyone remember? Uh, what is one? <laughs> one of the things we can do, in fact, we can take all of these things, right? We can take all of these things 
and just print them from C program, if you know what I mean. Right, we can just print them and see what they mean. Something like that. Uh, that was that was kind of strange. So for these two things, we need to have something. Otherwise, it just doesn't work as smooth as I would like it to. So it's going to print F, right, and then equal to LD, right. Uh huh. So and then I can do int main uh, something like this. Return zero something like that and now let me save all of this thing to main.c uh-huh cool and maybe i'm gonna include stdio so gcc main main.c and let me run the entire stuff so we don't have any of this stuff in here probably because i need to include unistd right uh e-access also is not declared so what do i have to include to have all of those things. Maybe I need to include error null. Could be. There we go. Permission. I don't have a permission. So that's the problem. Uh, I didn't have the permission to do so. So probably I have to run my program from root. And by the way, we have an unprecedented opportunity to actually turn all of that stuff into port code and copy-paste into the uh, standard library, right, like so. So now I can just go ahead and literally copy-paste this entire stuff into std.port. So I already have E, mm, yeah, so I have this kind of stuff. Uh, so there is no entry and there is no E again, right. Okay, so I suppose this is what I have to do. Uh, all right, can I sort all of that? I can sort them by like, uh, you know, lexicographical stuff, but that's fine. Uh, all right, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it basically needs a root. Um, and we can even do something like um, main.port, main.port. And for instance, if this entire thing is less than zero, right? Mm -mm. I'm just thinking, how, what would be the best way to actually do that? What would be the best way? Uh, we might try to do something like this, like dupe uh, e uh, perm gate, and if it's equal to that, uh, not enough, not enough permission to ch root. Right, so we already have this sort of information in here. Um, right, and then otherwise, um, um, error could not ch root because of reasons, right? So we don't really know the reasons yet, but yeah, uh, because we only care about the uh, permission stuff, right? Um, so that's literally why, okay. So I'm going to try to run this entire thing and not enough permissions to ch root. So we actually confirmed that, which is cool. Okay, so let's do main and I'm going to do sudo. Uh, there we go. And yeah, so it worked. So you literally have to uh, basically have enough permissions. So which also adds another layer of complication to uh, testing this entire thing. So I did all of that just to prove a point that I don't want to spend time setting up the testing environment that uses ch root and some other things. Uh, right, you see? Um, so, But that was actually very interesting, uh, you know, exercise, like just exploration of, you know, of the Linux operating system. That's pretty cool. Mm, okay. Mm, so, and if I got what I was about to do, honestly, um, I forgot what, what I was about to do. So is that the entire change or do we want to do anything else? Do we want to do anything else? I wanted to try to, yeah. So what if I try to include myself, right? Right. So let's actually remove all of that stuff. Though a ch root in the standard library also going to be useful, right? So let me find proc read and I'm going to just put it in here. 
So I, I have a like I'm trying to get into the habit like every time I'm um, you know, adding some bindings to some C calls or some constants for the uh, standard C library. I try to add them to the uh, to the standard library of Porth so I can use them the next time. So yeah, so that's that's basically the habit uh, that I'm trying to get into. <clears throat> All right. So none of that sort of work and exploration goes to waste, right? Because we're adding things into the standard library. Cheers, by the way. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Mm -mm. All right. Oh yeah, thank you. Thank you for reminding me. I want you to, yeah, I want you to test. Yeah, yeah. So that's what we want you to do. <laughs> yeah, I'm just remembering the 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 tangent on which I went. All right. So okay. Cool. Um. So first of all. Mm -mm. Got lost in the fields of yucks. Yes, that's what I did. Uh, okay, so what? Let me think. So in the Python three uh, from OS import path uh, abs path, if I have something like this, it will get. Well, it's not starting with anything, so that's fine. All right. So first of all, n is has to be greater than zero, right? So it has to be greater than zero. Uh-huh. All right. So it is greater than zero. <laughs> and I'm just thinking, what would be the easiest way to actually go about this stuff? Maybe I'm going to have proc is abs int pointer boolean, right? And in that case, I can just do ns, right, n is greater than zero, if, and then um, something like s8 uh, is equal to slash. And believe it or not, this is it, I think. You can even turn it into a single line to look even more epic. So let n and s and greater than zero if and then there we go and double end double end at the end doesn't really look great but that's fine mm -hmm. though hmm. so if you kind of okay so i'm trying to uh, code golf right now so i don't think code golfing right now is, is a good idea um so n and s uh, is abs right is it absolute right is it absolute if it is absolute already the thing we have to do we just have to normalize it right so n s uh norm path that's it otherwise we're starting to do that stuff right i guess that is it isn't it i think i think i think yes uh which also means that we could have just inlined this thing in here but I'm not gonna do that. This looks weird as fuck. I'm using if conditions to compute the condition for if condition. Though here, yeah, I'll probably have to do something like else false, but yeah. So let's just keep it as is abs. Um, and s is abs. By the way, people have been subscribing for quite some time, so let me acknowledge that. Uh, Jordana BC, I think I already acknowledged you. Thank you so much. Uh, hey GVT, uh, thank you for gifting tier one sub to High Breaker. Uh, and Deep Singularity, thank you so much for 11 months of tier 1 subscription. Thank you, thank you everyone for supporting the channel. I really, really appreciate that. That is very, very cool. Okay, so uh, let me go in here. Uh, and I want to take a look at the absolute path, right? So this is already an absolute path. Uh, ABS path. So we found a bug and I suppose we also fixed it. Um, Mm, put. Cool. This is already an absolute path, but if I do something like this, it will be uh, expanded. Okay, so we actually distinguish between them. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, for, for finding the bug in MTPL. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. That is very, very cool. Um, so now, mm, I think I'm going to do that separately. Mm -mm -mm. So fix bug in abs path 
when the path is already absolute. Uh, when the path is already absolute. Okay. Uh huh. So we've got that. Um, so add ch root related stuff to std.port. So that's also useful. And also this, this one. So what I want you to do, I want you to see what's going to happen if you start including yourself, right? Go include yourself. Uh, so I think it will result into something rather interesting, especially if you try to include yourself like this, right? So because we're not particularly normalizing that first uh, sort of inclusion, uh, it kind of, okay, it kind of went on the include loop. Oh yeah, I see. Um, should I care about this kind of stuff? I'm not even sure. So, since I'm not sure if I should care about that first compilation, because, look, um, in port.port, uh, proc, compile file into ops, right? So, this is the function that we're calling every time we're including a file, right? So, we found a keyword include, we do a couple of checks, right? We're checking that you, like, provided the string and so on and so forth. And then we call in compile file into ops yet again. So this, uh, this, as you can see, is a recursive function, right? So this is a function and it's calling itself when you're trying to include something, right? But this function is called for the first time with whatever user provided in the command line, right? And we don't really expand whatever the user provided in the command line. So we don't really do that. Uh, which is rather interesting. The question is, should we do that? Should we do that? And I can't really come up with the, uh, you know, situation when this may cause problems. Unless you start including yourself, but you generally don't want to include yourself. I'm going to put it to do in here, uh, and I'm going to think about that later. Should we normalize the uh, entry module um, module path before the compilation, right? So that's the question that I have in here, um, right? And I'm not sure. I'm genuinely not sure. Okay, so we have a couple of uh, like garbage files in here, so I'm gonna just like you know remove all of them. Um, all right. <laughs> <clears throat> so normalize uh, file paths before including them. Uh, this makes the include once functionality more robust uh, since um, the absolute the absolute normalized paths are more stable they're more stable whatever is that supposed to mean anyway so um i need to recompile the compiler with itself i suppose so i'm gonna compile the compiler uh, mm -hmm. maybe i didn't have to do that because it's already kind of compiled all right so and now i'm gonna run the tests and see if we didn't break anything so that may break something because of the error messages, I think. I think something may break because of the error messages, but we'll see. Okay, so that's already interesting. Oh, okay, we literally have the situation of a file including itself. And, okay, okay, okay. Um, and we're kind of using the full path oh shit we're using the full path uh in the error messages which is uh which is kind of painful mm. which is kind of painful because i'm pretty sure the user don't want to see uh the absolute path in the in the diagnostics right so the the user don't want to see that so we'll have to think about how to resolve that so uh, for now, maybe I'm going to just ignore uh, the include file. Uh, I just want to see uh, 
right if the rest of the tests are passing so i just want to make sure that the rest of the stuff because we have a lot of different test tests so like examples and uh the oily problems just want to make sure that those work okay oh yeah th that one is annoying because even though i ignore it it still fails to compile right it's because it's kind of the point of this entire thing okay i'm gonna like test this stuff manually so i'm gonna go into the examples and just like test the examples um test the examples okay so that's fine and for the uh for the oiler for the oiler problems i'm gonna do something like this mm, all right I guess everything's fine except the reporting, right? Except the reporting, which is kind of annoying. Um, so, which leads to the question, how are we going to do all that? So, include paths um, resolve. Where is the include path resolve? So maybe we're not gonna apply absolute path uh, as part of the include paths resolution, if you know what I mean. So include path resolution just returns you the um, the relative path that you've got. Though we can try to uh, normalize it at least, right? So I think normalizing that path would be fine because we are just concatenating the, uh, this kind of stuff. Um, all right, so let me recompile the entire thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're normalizing it now. Uh, and that should be fine. So here's the idea. What if we... Uh, yeah, what if we store... What if we use the absolute path only for the indication but for the rest of the stuff in the, in the source code, we use whatever the user has provided. Um, that would be interesting, I think. I think that would be interesting. And is it even achievable? Is it even achievable? That's a good question. Um, so let me see. Uh, include paths. Include paths. Uh, resolve file. Resolve file. Mm -hmm. So this is where we resolve file and we add the file. So the file is currently located in a temporary buffer and we're moving it into the uh, file buffer. So here's the thing. Um, we have like the paths to the files have to survive for the entirety of the compilation. Right. So that means we need to have a separate buffer for them that it, that is not cleaned up as often as the temporary one. Right. So here we resolve the file. It is in a temporary buffer. We have to move it into the file path buffer. Right. And then we'll be able to clean up the temporary buffer. Um, so that's basically what's going on in here. So this is include path. And um, maybe on top of that, once we've got the include path, I might clone it. And. Huh. Yeah, I might clone it and then compute the absolute path. Okay, I think I, I think I know how I'm going to do that. All right. So this is where I start the file buffer. Then I append uh, whatever I've got from the file resolution. And then I append the uh, the rest of the thing. Right. So I append the rest of the thing. Uh, when I'm appending it, though, I'm losing it. So I probably have to do let in here. Right, so there's going to be something like this. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. So N and S. So this is the second one, FPB and uh, N S. Uh, absolute path, right? So I turn in it in turn turn it into absolute path. Then I append into the file buffer, and then I allocate like a null uh, null thing in here. Okay, cool. So what that means that now in here we have not only include path but also absolute include path, right? Uh, 
And when we're looking up the module, we're not looking up the include path, we're looking at absolute include path, right? We're looking at absolute one. And when we start in a new module, we're including, we're using absolute include path, but when we compile something, we're using the original one. You see what I'm doing here? Right. So for all of the module lookup and module start, I'm using the absolute path. But when it comes to actual compilation, I'm using this one. So this one is sort of like an indication, like a unique ID uh, for, for the module, right? Um, hopefully that makes sense. All right. So in both full path and uh, relative path are stored in a, in a file buffer um, of some sort. Mm -mm. Okay, so let me recompile this entire thing. And unknown fpb end, uh, I think it has to be file path buffer. All right, is it comp uh, compilable? I think it is compilable. All right, so if I try to temporary buffer capacity exceeded, uh, need to call TMP clean more often. That is unexpected. Hmm. Why was it exceeded so easily? Because I actually re keep rewinding it. Don't I? Um, so let me, let me see where it is complaining. Uh, it is complaining specifically in here. So yeah, it couldn't, it couldn't handle that shit. Wow. Uh, and then not even, okay. Because yeah, I just like do it like that. And then, and then I rewind it. That's what's interesting about that. Like I rewind it after this entire stuff. So shouldn't be that bad so this is an absolute path huh mm -hmm. okay so and the temporary buffer itself is actually very big it's eight megabytes like i don't think i would waste eight megabytes in here how would i that, that's that's very strange um all right so maybe maybe in here um, hmm. <laughs> One of the things we can do uh, in the entire compilation, right? When we finished compiling the entire file, maybe we can clean up the whole buffer, so to speak, right? Can I do TMP end? And then here, at the end in here, I can just do TMP rewind. Because I'm pretty sure like everything that is allocated between those things is not particularly needed, right? So I don't think it is needed that much, So, but it might be leaking somewhere. Uh, it might be actually leaking somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it couldn't open that file. Hmm. All right, so that is very really strange. Uh, proc. Okay. Something is weird going on. So maybe we caught some sort of a bug. Yeah, it feels like some sort of a bug. Legit. Because, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so let me... Let me do the following thing. Like every time we're allocating, I'm going to take the TMP size and I'm going to just like literally print it, right? I'm going to literally print it just to see how quickly this entire thing grows, because that's very interesting. Uh, okay, so. Oh. Huh. So. For quite some time, the size of the temporary buffer stayed relatively small until something like boom, and it just like allocated everything. That's a lot. Like, it's just like, why did it all of a sudden like blew up? Um, so that is not, uh, yeah, it's, it's basically blew up after I tried to compile STD port. And in fact, like, I'm not even doing anything in STD ports that, like, should allocate this much. I didn't think so. I don't even include anything in there. So it's some sort of a strange bug. 
some sort of a strange bug and I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. Module start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why don't you rewind though? Mm -hmm. mm -mm. Let me see. That is bizarre. TMP a lock. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely bizarre. Mm -hmm. Resolve file. Okay. So I want to just check the size, TMP size, 64 print. So that's that. And then size after we rewinded that thing. Though we can just check the size in here. Right. And uh, yeah, let's see. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> So that's 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 the bug for you. Before, uh -huh. after. Well, we can actually use puts. So, so the size of the buffer before sixty-one bytes, the size of the buffer after. So, sounds like. Something related with arithmetics and whatnot. So do FPB TMP. Ah, I'm an idiot. I'm okay. Okay. I'm already tired because I'm streaming for two hours. So essentially, I'm rewinding one of these things instead of that one, because I have more things on the stack. Okay, so that's what happens when I stream for too long. All right, all right. So uh, essentially, it's just like, yeah, uh, that's what you want. You want to rewind to, to that point. Okay. All right. So at least I caught that. At least I caught that. Uh, and, okay, I will keep in mind, uh, I will make a mental note that just going into TMP alloc and printing the size of the, um, of the temporary buffer every time you allocate is a very good way of debugging this thing. It is a very good way of debugging because you can kind of see, uh, you know, how quickly the temporary buffer grows and yeah. So, because like 8 megabytes for temporary objects that get cleaned up super quickly, that's a lot. So, if you overflow this size, um, you're probably doing something wrong. There's some sort of a bug. Um, so, let's actually try to fix this bug now. Hopefully, that will work. There you go, it works. So as you can see, it works. Okay, so I, I caught the bug. That's that's great. So and it's actually like when the program is not buggy. Let's see how uh, you know how different this size, how grows and shrinks the size of the temporary buffer, right? Because the temporary buffer constantly grows and shrinks, grows and shrinks, and something is with internet, so we're losing some frames, but doesn't matter. Okay, so. This is how the buffer, the size of the buffer should stay throughout the compilation. Right. It like, look at the size. Right. It, it doesn't get like, it, uh, it grows and shrinks, grows and shrinks. And this is because we're allocating small intermediate objects into that, uh, into that buffer. And then we're deallocating them with the rewinding. So we have a little bit of a leakage. But I think this like four kilobyte leakage is from the top level where I don't really care because I'm about to quit the program anyway. Uh, right. So yeah, that's how temporary buffer usually stays. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Just Lucy, thank you so much for seven months of tier one subscription. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome back to our fourth club. So yeah. And the temporary buffer is 
literally it here you go so this is a very good uh, example so we allocate one byte then another byte then a couple of more bytes and then we deallocate it so that's basically the deallocations within uh this temporary buffer so that's the sizes so, well which probably not particularly well aligned i am aware of that but anyway um so yeah Mm -hmm. So and let's let's remove this entire thing. So now we are, in fact, uh, in using uh, the relative paths during the compilation, but we use absolute paths to check whether we already included that file before. So that's what we're doing. Uh, so and that should be a little bit more convenient for the user, right? So because a user like I personally don't want to see absolute full paths. Uh, because uh, they might be very long, right? So I don't care. I want to see the relative paths. Um, okay. And that is really strange. Why does it show me this thing anyway? Uh, that is sus. That is super sus. So this is that, uh, and then this is the absolute path. So this is the relative one. Uh, let me go here. This is normalized path. Hmm. Okay, so if I try to recompile the compiler with itself, it is still showing the absolute path. And this is because in when I'm compiling, it says compiling, uh, compiling, where is, where is compiling? Ah, okay. So, sure, 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 sure. Why are we doing it here? Exactly. I didn't think we have to do that in here. I didn't think so. Um, so, let me move that stuff to uh, proc compile file. Right. File system. Uh huh. Yeah. So when I'm compiling the file, I'm saying that I'm compiling, and that should be fine. All right. So let me move it in here. Mm -mm. Okay. So as you can see, we're using relative paths. Cool. And the ultimate test, ultimate ultimate test, include std port uh, proc main in. Uh huh. Hello world. Puts. Puts. And then I'm gonna just run main the port. Cool. And now I'm gonna try to include this the second time. Now I'm gonna try to include it like this the second time. And now I'm gonna try to do it like that. Uh, and it still works. So, and it tries to include only that one for the first time, right? But what if I try to include this for the first time? Uh, it still says compiling std. Oh, this is because we're normalizing it, do we? Do we normalize it? I already forgot. Uh, resolve file. I do normalize it. Okay, so no matter what I do, I still normalize it in there. Okay, so that works. So no matter what, like how I include that, it still works perfectly. All right, that is very cool. Um, so I think we did that. So now we have the best of both worlds. The best of both worlds. Oh, we can recompile a couple of times. And now uh, I want to run the tests. So I suppose the, uh, the self-inclusion will still fail, but it will still fail because we're normalizing the path. So it might remove dot slash because of that. Uh, we're about to find out. Yeah, 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 there we go. So, well, it removed the dot slash. In any case, uh, what I want to do is just, I want to update output uh, tests. Uh, where's the tests? I'm in the wrong folder, of course. Uh, update output tests self including file, right? So, and let's take a look at the changes we, we have in here. Uh, right, so it, it essentially removed uh, dot slash 
which is fine, right? So I don't really care about that much. And it, the reason it removed it is because we're now normalizing the path and uh, part of the normalization is removing this thing, right? So that's how normalization works right now. Uh, okay, so let's try to run full tests one more time. One more time. So we've got some subs. Uh, let me take a look at them. Uh, thank you so much, Confix21, for four months of tier one subscription. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Whoop, whoop. All right, so yeah, everything seems to be working. Everything seems to be working. Is it? Mm -mm. Do, 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 do. Okay, so what did we do in here? Um, no. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Use absolute path to include file as the unique ID for include once. Again. The who needs articles? Uh, so, okay. So, and now I'm also going to update the bootstrap. So, let's update the bootstrap. Mm -mm. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Update bootstrap. And let's push that right into the repo. All right, so we've done a lot of stuff today. This is very, very exciting. So we have more or less usable include file functionality, and I can start separating the standard library properly. So one of the reasons why I wanted to have that is because, yeah, I want to be able to start separating the standard library into layers, right? So I want to have like a Linux layer, Linux specific things. Then on top of Linux, I want to have POSIX specific things. And then on top of POSIX specific things, I want to have the port specific things, uh, like a standard library of port. And then I want to rewrite, make sure, not rewrite, but make sure that the compiler only using the uh, higher level standard library, right? So it's not dependent from POSIX or Linux. So then I can easily port the compiler to WinAPI or to any POSIX operating system or anything like that. So, right, so I basically want to establish sort of like a standard API. Uh, which is portable across several things. And once I do that, this is where a conditional compilation uh, would come into place, right? So does anyone have any questions maybe uh, before we wrap up? So I'm just looking into the chat, scrolling, seeing was, was there any questions? Uh, mm -hmm. What's the conditional compilation? It's basically compiling different code depending on a certain condition. For instance, if you are on Linux, the code will, will be compiled one way. If you are on Windows, the same code will be compiled differently. So there is a condition that is checked at compile time, and depending on some certain condition, you may compile or may not compile certain pieces of code or in a certain way. Uh, what about the JIT to speed everything up? We already use ahead of time compilation. We don't need the just in time compilation. JIT is not needed when you have AOT. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other questions? Mm -hmm. All right, so I guess no questions. Thanks everyone who's watching me right now. I really appreciate that. 
Have a good one, and I see you on the next uh, Zozin session, right? Uh, where we continue doing different things, maybe Porth, maybe something else. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for uh, subscriptions, for bits and stuff like that. And I see you all next time. Love you. Mwah.